thank you very much for the kind invitation to let me present some of our work here today. Uh, and what I will talk about is uh, CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing and how we can study this mechanism using long read sequencing. And I don't think I need to convince you about so why CRISPR-Cas9 is an amazing tool, uh, but one of the things that we could be worried about is that it can also produce some unintended effects of targets. Uh, and if you go into the literature, there are uh, a, a number of studies that could make you be worried that this could be a problem. Uh, but also on the other side, uh, there are also uh, a number of studies, perhaps even more, uh, that tells us that uh, where they have tried to look for these of targets uh, in living cells and couldn't find any. So it's a bit unclear right now uh, how worried we should be about this. Uh, and when it comes to the CRISPR system, uh, these what happens uh, when we want to predict guide RNAs is usually that we're using some tools that are based on sequence comparison. Uh, and how this works is that we have a guide RNA, uh, usually a, like 25 base pair sequence, and we compare it to a reference genome. Uh, this is a quick and easy way of doing it, and it gives you some kind of results, but it could be difficult to know if this means that the, the guide will actually bind at this location. And another problem is that we're using a reference genome that might be different from the cells that we're actually using in our experiments. Uh, there are also methods where we can instead use in vitro based methods and sequencing to do this, but they are based on short read sequencing and are limited by PCR amplification and also, uh, of course, the read length of the technologies. Uh, this slide is just to illustrate how, how we can think about uh, this thing where we match the guide RNA to a reference genome. Uh, so let's say that the guide RNA is binding at this specific location, but in an individual that we're studying, perhaps we have a, a number of SNPs uh, represented by these arrows below, which makes this guide RNA no longer bind at this location, but perhaps it's instead binding at another location in, in the genome that becomes more similar to the, to the guide RNA. Uh, and one question we can ask ourselves is if we really can study this CRISPR of targets effect if we don't know the exact sequence of the genome that we're looking into. Uh, we have been trying to address this using long read sequencing, and we just have a preprint out if you're interested to, to check this out on, on BioArchive. And here I want to highlight Ida Hoyer, who has been doing a lot of the work in developing protocols uh, for long read sequencing to measure these uh, off target effects. This slide shows how these methods work. So we have one protocol based on PAC bio sequencing. We call this SMART OTS, where OTS stands for off-target sequencing. Uh, and we also have a protocol for nanopore sequencing, which is called nano OTS. Uh, and I will not go into all the details of these protocols, uh, but two things that can be noted is that we are using random shearing of DNA uh, at the first step, so it's no restriction enzyme or, or anything involved. Uh, and another thing is that we're using one guide RNA for doing this targeting. There are also methods now for doing targeting, but where we're using two guide RNAs to enrich for a region, but in this case, we're just using one single guide RNA. Uh, and the DNA that we studied in th this case was the HEC293 cell line. Uh, this is a human embryonic kidney cell line that was uh, cultured way back in the 70s. It has all types of strange aberrations, uh, but what we did then was to sequence this cell line using PacBio Hi-Fi reads. So these are the high quality and, uh, and long reads that we can get from the SQL2 system. Uh, and we have, uh, I've included here a slide showing uh, a representation of some of these Hi-Fi reads. So these are like 15 KBs, uh, and we can use these to find SNP variation and also larger structural variation. And we can also get phasing of haplotypes. Uh, so now, with this genome sequenced, we can determine the exact sequences where these guide RNAs are actually binding. Okay, so the experimental setup we did in this project was to use three different guide RNAs, and then we applied both of these two protocols, both the smart sequencing and the nanopore sequencing. Uh, the guide RNAs are called ATXN10, MMP14, and NIC1. So these are guides that we're using in some of our experiments. And what we also did was to, to develop an analysis method to identify these off targets at base pair resolution. 
Uh, the way this works is basically that we map the reads first, and then uh, because of the, these molecules are now cleaved by Cas9, it will give rise to a very specific type of pattern that is illustrated in point two here. Uh, and we can identify these peaks very easily because the, we are looking for patterns where reads are starting or ending at the same position. Uh, and then we can take this whole peak region, we can look into it and see if we have a sequence that is similar to one of the guide RNAs that we have in our experiment. And by this, we can then uh, assign each peak to a specific guide. And then we can also visualize the results. Uh, this is a slide showing how it looks at the on-target sites for these three guide RNAs. So at the top, we have the smart sequencing uh, reads. At the bottom, we have the nanopore sequencing reads. This red line corresponds to the Cas9 cleavage site. And you can see that we have these very specific type of patterns, which means that we can uh, identify these, uh, these peaks very easily. Uh, but what also happens is that we have uh, these similar types of peaks also at other sites in the genome. Uh, and here are three of these sites for ATXN10, MMP14, and NEC1. Uh, at the top, again, we have the smart sequencing, and on the bottom, we have nanopore sequencing. And as you can see, we find these three off-targets uh, by both methods. Uh, and uh, for two of these off-targets, we have three mismatches for the guide RNA compared to the HEC genome. And for the last one, in fact, we have five mismatches, but still get binding, which is kind of surprising, perhaps. Uh, we can then summarize all of these results. In total, we found 55 uh, off-targets by both of these two methods. Uh, most of them were for ATXN10. Uh, then we found a bunch of them for MMP14, and I think two or three for, for NEC1. Uh, and in these figures, uh, mismatches are illustrated by these colored boxes. We also, in some cases, find insertion or deletion mismatches, uh, but still get uh, uh, guide RNA binding. Uh, one thing that was kind of interesting if we look into specific examples was that we could also find evidence of allele-specific uh, Cas9 cleavage. Uh, so in this figure, we have uh, now, if you look into the bottom, we have a reference haplotype and an alternative haplotype if we look into the HiFi data from PacBio. Uh, and the reference haplotype has lots of SNPs here, but the alternative haplotype has only three SNPs. Uh, but if we look at, at the off-target sequencing data, we have only uh, the alternative haplotype represented. Uh, and this means that the guide RNA is not binding to the reference haplotype because then we have three mismatches for the guide RNA compared to the, to the genomic DNA. Uh, but for the alternative haplotype, we have only two mismatches and then we get binding. Uh, and the conclusion of this is that genetic variation can affect a guide RNA binding, uh, at least in vitro, uh, which I think is kind of important because this means that different individuals can get different types of off-targets, which is perhaps also a bit scary. Uh, what we also did in collaboration with Jason Chin was to assemble all of these hi-fi reads using the new assembler Peregrine, uh, and by this we can then com con construct a complete de novo genome uh, we were able to assemble this into a quite high-quality genome, and then we mapped our off-target sequencing data to this de novo assembled genome. Uh, and in this way, we could, in fact, recover more than 98% of the cleavage sites. Uh, and this means that sort of we can use these methods also in organisms where we don't have a known reference sequence. Uh, but one thing that sort of question that remains is, okay, what does this mean in living cells? Because so far we've only been looking into native DNA or DNA that is sort of fragmented and, and where we have uh, a sequencing experiment done uh, only on DNA. But we want to see how this looks in living cells as well. So we conducted an experiment on fibroblast cells where we first performed this assay to identify potential of targets. Uh, then we performed CRISPR-Cas9 editing in these cells. Uh, so in, in this process, only a fraction of the cells will be edited. So these are the green cells in this figure. Uh, and what we did then was to design long-range PCRs to amplify regions both in the control fibroblasts, the wild type, and also in the edited fibroblasts. 
Okay, so in this way we can see what happens at these at these editing sites. Uh, and I should mention that this is very preliminary data. We're still sort of looking into this. Uh, but what we noticed for this is for the MMP14 on target sites. And here we have a bunch of reads. In reality, we have thousands of reads, but this is just a, a small representation. And now we have the Cas9 cleavage site in the middle of this figure. Uh, and what we could see is that we find many small insertions and deletions at the uh, predicted on target site. Or, I mean, that's, that's expected because uh, that's what we think is going to happen. Uh, but we also have some strange things showing up here. So we have a 500 base pair deletion also at this on target. So maybe we have some kind of strange structural variation that can be induced in some of the reads. Uh, and also we found a 328 base pair insertion. And if we look closer into this insertion sequence, we can see that it's identical uh, to a part of the cloning vector that was used in the CRISPR experiment. So for some reason this uh, part of the cloning vector is jumping in uh, at this particular site. And we have several reads with these types of insertions. Uh, but if we instead look at the wild type cells, actually there's not much happening at all. Uh, and so this shows that we in fact have editing at this site. Okay, but what, what happens then at the off-target sites? Uh, and this is one off-target site that we found in uh, with quite many reads, both in the smart sequencing and, the, and in the nanopore sequencing. Uh, and this was a bit unexpected, but we didn't see much happening at all uh, in the edited fibroblasts or in the wild type. So we don't see any evidence of editing here. Uh, and this slide just shows what, what it looks like if we try to uh, make a calculation on all of these reads. I mean, I only showed a small representation. So to the left, we have here the number of insertions and deletions at the on-target site. And you can see that we have this very high peak at the, at the Cas9 site. Uh, but if we look at the off-target, uh, then we don't see this at all. So basically, we don't find uh, off-target genome editing in this experiment. Uh, and this is perhaps a bit surprising, but it's also kind of interesting, and it raises a bunch of new questions. So why do we have uh, editing at the on-target site, but not at the off-target site in these fibroblast cells? Uh, and we're still thinking about this. We have actually no idea why this is happening, but one, some things that we could guess is perhaps it has something to do with the chromatin structure. Maybe in these fibroblasts, you know, the chromatin is very compact and the guide RNA uh, can't get access to the DNA. Uh, or could it be the CRISPR-Cas9 method that we're using? So we have this vector, which is a kind of a gentle way of doing uh, editing. Perhaps if we use another method, then we're forcing uh, off-targets to happen. We don't know. Uh, or could it be a protective mechanism going on in these living cells that prevents this off-target editing? Uh, or could it be something in the DNA repair, perhaps, in these fibroblasts, or something completely else? So something we're interested to do is to perform similar types of experiments also in cancer cell lines where we perhaps have more open chromatin and perhaps the DNA is not, DNA repair is not so efficient. Okay, so if we then come back to, to sort of the initial picture here, should we be worried or not? I think this ex uh, whole project has been a bit of a roller coaster. So, I mean, we have, now found that we see all these off-target sites in our in vitro experiment. We see that the guide RNAs can bind despite having many mismatches uh, and also that these large structural variants can be found, these large insertions and deletions at the on-target sites. So in this way we are kind of worried, uh, but then uh, with sort of the last results that we have now that we don't see any evidence of editing at the off-target sites, Perhaps it's not that bad after all, but uh, I mean, we're still very much looking into this and uh, we don't know yet how this will end. So uh, with that, I would like to come to the conclusion of this whole presentation. Uh, so I would say that with these new technologies that we have, the smart sequencing, the, the PacBio sequencing for off targets, and also these uh, high quality reads, we are able to generate very detailed map of Cas9 cleavage sites. Uh, we can find evidence of allele-specific uh, guide RNA binding, uh, and also uh, we are able to do this not only in humans, but also in organisms where we don't have any 
reference. Uh, but we still very much need to learn more about how these off-targets are, well, what's happening at these off-target sites in living cells. Yes, so that was uh, my talk for today. And I would like to end with a slide showing some of the people that have been involved uh, in this experiment. And thank you all for listening. <laughs>